So, of course, I want to start by saying thank you, everyone, for joining. My name is Cody Armstrong, and today we're talking about what's new in Onshape. And if you haven't attended one of these webinars in the past, what we'd like to do in these webinars is go back and look at the past updates and some of the features in the past updates and discuss them in detail. This is also your opportunity to ask any questions that you'd like. There's a questions dialog in the GoToWebinar control panel. Feel free to ask any question and I'll do my best to stop and answer the questions as we go through today's webinar. Now, this webinar is gonna be a bit different than ones we've done in the past. If you've watched a What's New webinar in the past, you know we tend to focus on just what was released in the last month, right? So this is the beginning of August. What we generally do here is talk about what happened in July. And we are gonna do that. We're going to discuss uh, what was released in July, but I also wanna take a, a broader look at 2017 as a whole and what's been released so far this year. So if you haven't touched Onshape in a while, if you haven't used Onshape in the past six months, I really just want to mention a few of the big things that we've done as of 2017, give you just a brief intro into some of the big new stuff that we've uh, that we've released this year. And we are going to focus on July, so don't worry if you've come for just the last month. But I do want to bring up again, as I mentioned, some of the big improvements for 2017. Just kind of a recap. All right, so let's dig into it again. Feel free to ask any question that you'd like uh, the, in the questions dialog there, and I'll do my best to, to stop and answer. All right, so let's get into it now. What I want to start off with is our mission statement with Onshape. So if you're new to Onshape, I always like to mention our goal with creating Onshape, and that is getting everyone working together with CAD on any device, anywhere. This includes mobile devices. So if you haven't downloaded the Onshape app for Android, for iOS, I definitely recommend it. You have not just a viewer, but a full-blown CAD editing tool on your phone or your tablet. Uh, one of the really unique things about Onshape. So again, it's CAD on any device. And this also includes Windows, Mac, Linux, even Chromebooks. You can access that CAD data. So again, our, our goal with Onshape, everyone working together with CAD on any device, anywhere. Now, the other thing I always like to mention is we do, of course, consider ourselves professional 3D CAD. But there are a lot of things about Onshape that really separate us from other professional 3D CAD systems. So generally, when you think of professional 3D CAD uh, and other you know, software applications, it's just parts, assemblies, and drawings. It's really those, those three functions. And there are a lot of things about Onshape that are built into its core functionality that are part of separate applications in other 3D CAD systems. And I'm going to go over an, an example of this in just a bit. Now, the, the other thing I always like to mention about Onshape that's very unique to Onshape is we update frequently. In fact, that's what we're talking about here today is all the various updates and the improvements that they bring. So frequent updates, roughly every three weeks. I'm going to get into more detail on that in a second, but it's something that definitely separates us from other professional 3D CAD systems. Not, you don't have once a year an update. You have, you know, roughly every three weeks new functionality being added. The other cool thing about Onshape's updates is you don't have to do anything, right? You log in and new features are there. Now, I mentioned before that Onshape has a lot of things that are built in that are not included in other professional 3D CAD systems. Uh, one example of this would be the built-in version control. Uh, you can you know, manage your CAD data, version control it, look at the history of it, and it's not something that you have to manage or purchase separately. So in other professional 3D CAD systems, you have you know, PDM systems, file management systems. In Onshape, that's not necessary. You have a built-in version control tool. It's not something that you have to think about or manage separately, it's just built-in. So built-in version control, also the ability to import and export common CAD format. So if you're coming from another CAD system, or if you have this library of CAD data in another format, chances are we can work with that. Right? We can import and work with that data. We can also export to common CAD formats as well. So we work well alongside other applications. So if you work with a vendor who uses SolidWorks, for instance, you can share your Onshape document and they can export to any number of different formats. And so it's a very easy to use application alongside other CAD applications because of this ability to import and export all these different formats. Now, one very unique thing about Onshape when you compare it to other professional 3D CAD systems is we have entirely new methods of collaboration. This is something that's very different than really any other 
Pro 3D CAD tools, you can work with others at the same time and everything updates in real time. So if you share your document with another user and that other user adds a fillet, for instance, you're going to instantly see that fillet on your screen. And it doesn't matter if you're in the same room or across the world, you have real-time simultaneous collaboration between users. Um, so entirely new methods of collaboration, and that's just one element of it. We also have integrated comment capabilities. We have follow mode. We have all these tools that just make for a better collaboration experience. If you do any kind of work with a team, definitely want to use Onshape for that. Now, the last thing I want to mention is customization with feature script. This is another unique element of Onshape that allows you to build your own CAD feature. So if you're at all interested in writing code, realize Onshape has a language that allows you to build your own CAD features. It's a specific language for that function. And it's really... Um, a very useful tool if you're trying to save time or trying to eliminate tedious tasks. It makes it so that you can create complex features and, and complex shapes with just a few clicks. Right? So consider FeatureScript if you're A, interested in building your own kind of CAD feature, and B, you don't have any kind of background in writing code. Very simple, easy to use language for building custom CAD features. All right, so let's dig into... The update process. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, Onshape's updates are a bit different. So if you've come from a SolidWorks or an Inventor or Creo or one of those types of applications, you may be familiar with once a year getting an update. Uh, it's a bit different in Onshape. So roughly every three weeks, you're going to see new features being added to Onshape. Now, the thing I always like to stress is there is no big downloads or installs or updates. Everything is totally automatic, totally transparent. Uh, you log in and new features are there. There's no background downloading and installing. There's no installs, period. So it makes the update process very easy. You simply log in and you're up to date. Uh, it also means that everyone using Onshape is using the same version. If you've come from a file-based world, you may be familiar with the problem of, you know, I can't share my file with this person because they're using an older version of X software, right? Um, so that file compatibility goes away with Onshape because everyone using Onshape is always on the latest version. Now, of course, updates include new functionality, and that's what we're talking about here today. So we are going to discuss what's been added. And not just what's been added in the last month, we are going to discuss that, but we're also going to discuss some of the big things that have been added in the last eight months, you know, so far in 2017. So that's a short intro into our update process. The key things I would take away is it happens roughly every three weeks and you don't have to do anything. You just see new features pop up. Now, if you're interested in following along, um, obviously this, this webinar is a great resource for that. We also have a blog post every three weeks to highlight those new features and you can sign up for that as well. All right, so let's dig into it. Now, today's agenda is pretty straightforward. We're going to look at 2017. So far, I just want to point out some of the big improvements that we've done. So if you haven't used Onshape in a while, I always like to mention some of these big improvements that you may have missed. And then we're going to get into what happened in July. As we always do with these What's New webinars, we want to focus on the last month and the functionality in it. And I want to pick a few improvements, just a few from the list, and walk you through them and walk through uh, all the details of them, and give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you'd like. So again, use that questions dialog in the go to webinar control panel, and I'll do my best to answer them. Metal sheets are very difficult in the program. Uh, bear with me. I am going to show you sheet metal. So if you're referring to sheet metal, bear with me. I will walk through a demo of sheet metal in just a second. All right, so... Again, that's the agenda. Um, I, feel free to ask any question as we go through things here, and I'll stop from time to time and answer all the questions. All right, so I mentioned before, I want to take a look at 2017 so far as a whole because we've done a lot in a very short amount of time. It's very easy to miss things in terms of improvements. So uh, if you're not aware, again, every three weeks we add new features, and this is the list of improvements up to mid-June. We're going to discuss July in just a bit. But up to mid-June, this is the list of improvements. And as you can see, very fine font. You can't actually make out each 
improvement, but there's a lot there, right? So many, many improvements so far this year. And these aren't small things. These are big things, right? So in February, we announced sheet metal. That's one of the small line items that you see in that list of improvements. But I bring up this slide just to show you that every three weeks we're adding new things and they're relatively big new features. We're not talking about adding you know, a different icon, for instance, or changing something simple. We're talking about adding big new functionality to the software. So this is kind of a high level, what have we done in the last eight months? A lot of things. And, and obviously we don't have the time to discuss all of them here today. So what I want to do is focus on some of my favorites. And I think some of the biggest improvements that we've done in the, in the past eight months. And I'd say probably the biggest for most users out there is simultaneous sheet metal. Uh, the ability to create sheet metal parts, see the flat view simultaneously, see the table view simultaneously, is something that has really changed you know, Onshape's capabilities. It, it allows for a lot of new users to come in and start using it because a lot of their job was dependent on sheet metal design. So I'm gonna walk you through sheet metal in just a moment, real quick simple demonstration of sheet metal. Um, the other thing I always like to mention when we talk about big improvements this year uh, is in context design. Managing context design is something that's really unique to Onshape. Our architecture allows for some really cool stuff when we talk about designing in context, in the context of the assembly. Um, so managed in context came out in January, actually. Um, simultaneous sheet metal came out in February. So these, again, are really big improvements coming out back to back, right, within a month or two. So simultaneous sheet metal, managed in context design were probably two of the biggest new improvements that happened over the last eight months. And I'm gonna show you an example of both of them in just a second. Now, once we moved past sheet metal, once we've, we added sheet metal, we added in context design, the focus really shifted to a lot of surfacing tools. And so you're gonna see kind of the the core surfacing functionality has been built to a point where you can create complex surface models using our surfacing tools and the key was a lot of curves and a lot of new surfacing commands i'm going to go over some of those in just a bit but um you know commands like projected curve composite curve bridging curve are very very valuable when we start talking about creating complex you know more advanced shapes right uh, so just keep in mind Many curve tools have been added. I already briefly listed them, but projected curve, bridging curve, composite curve, uh, 3D spline tools, all of those are valuable tools when we talk about creating more advanced curved shapes. Right. So uh, surfacing tools, curve tools, those have really been a big focus as of the last six months or so, and you'll see a lot of improvements in that area. Now, the last thing I want to mention, this is more for those in the... Um, you know, company realm, when we talk about data management and things like that, is custom properties. Uh, as a company owner, you can build your own properties into your documents and propagate them very easily to your team, right? So we've added the ability to create your own property. We've also added really unique, intelligent ways to manage the property types and, you know, even the ability to link to usernames and all kinds of things like that. So um, again, these are generally PDM level functions that we've built into core on shape. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, I showed you that slide. There's a lot of stuff that we haven't discussed here. So just keep in mind, um, you know, many, many improvements have taken place over the past eight months. I just wanted to highlight some of my personal favorites. Sheet metal, in context design, and all the various curves and surfacing tools are very high on my personal list of improvements. Naturally, custom properties are critical to any company. Uh, you know, really using Onshape for project design, and we're we're very happy to have that now. All right, so let's get into some of these things. Now, uh, I mentioned before, I wanted to pick and choose some of my favorite improvements and walk through examples of them. I'm going to start with simultaneous sheet metal. Now, uh, sheet metal was announced in February, mid-February, and we've actually added a number of improvements to that initial sheet metal release. In fact, just about every update since February has included some new sheet metal functionality. So realize we announced sheet metal in February, but we're working on it all the time. Now, what I wanted to do is walk you through the three basic ways that we have for creating a sheet metal part. 
right? So just keep in mind, there are three techniques for creating a sheet metal part. Now, any sheet metal part, here you can see I have my simple enclosure example, and I've extruded a solid boss that kind of reflects that envelope that I want for the sheet metal part. And what I want to do here is create my sheet metal housing. And I'm going to use this as an opportunity to discuss the three different ways that we have for creating sheet metal. Now, you'll see the sheet metal command in the far right of the toolbar. You'll see sheet metal model here. I select sheet metal model, and you'll see the three different ways that we have for creating a sheet metal part. So you have convert, extrude, and thicken. Now convert, as the name implies, converts a solid part into a sheet metal part. So if you're looking for, you know, just give me, you know, this shape in sheet metal, convert is what you're looking for. It's going to take a solid part and, and offset all the faces and allow you to convert that into a sheet metal part. Now, the next option, if you've come from a SolidWorks or an Inventor or one of those types of applications, very common, and that is extruding open sketch profiles. So if you're familiar with the process of sketching an open contour and then extruding that contour and then that flattening out, the extrude option is what you're looking for. If you're familiar with that workflow and that's what you like to use, you'll most likely be using extrude quite often. Now the last option is thicken, and this allows you to select faces, thicken them, and then convert them into sheet metal parts. So let's walk through a demo of each of these op options. As I said before, these are the three ways that we have for creating new sheet metal parts. And I'm going to start with convert. So I select convert and I left click the part that I want to convert into sheet metal. As soon as I do that, what it does is it offsets all the faces in that solid part. But initially, they're not joined. They're just a bunch of disjoint faces that have been offset. So it's up to me to define where are my bins. So once you define what part you want to create sheet metal out of, then you go in and say, here are my bins for my sheet metal part. And literally just click on the edges. You can see right here, I have a sheet metal face here, sheet metal face here. I want to join them with a bend. So I left click the edge and now they are one sheet metal part with the edge here defined in the bin. So that's converting a part. You simply go along, you define your part A, of course, and then you go along and define all of the edges that you want to be bins. It's intelligent enough to know if you select an edge where two come together, it should automatically create that corner relief, right? So as I select that third edge there, you'll see it automatically creates that corner relief that joins them. Now, let's get into some of the things that you can control in the sheet metal model. We've converted our part to sheet metal. Now, I want to exclude a few of these faces. You can see I still have a few faces left here in my sheet metal feature. I don't want to use those in this example, so I'm going to click faces to exclude and then just left click each individual face and say ignore those for this feature. Now, I still want to keep the original part that drove all of this, right? So I'm going to check keep input part. That will leave me with that initial part that we used to build this sheet metal envelope. I'm gonna use this again in just a moment, so that's why I want to keep it. Now, the next natural question that comes up is how do I set things like sheet metal thickness, bin radius, K factor? All of those are options down here at the bottom of your sheet metal model command. So in sheet metal model, you'll see thickness. You can flip the direction of the thickness. You can change the bin radius. You can change the K factor, minimal gap settings, default corner relief types, default bin relief types, and the scale for those as well. So you can change all of the settings that pertain to this sheet metal part. So think of this as kind of defining all of that up front. Now, when you add flanges and other things later, they're going to follow these rules unless you explicitly change them, right? So I can hit the green check, okay. And now we have our first sheet metal part in my design. Now, the question then comes up, well, where can I see the flat view? How do I see the flat view? Once you have a sheet metal part in your document, you're going to see a little icon on the far right of the interface for sheet metal table and flat view. 
And if you left click that, it will bring up your flat views for that part studio. So here's my flat view. If I needed to export to DXF, for instance, and maybe go, you know, laser cut this or water jet cut, whatever it may be, I can just right click the flat view and you'll see that option to export. So I can see the flat view. I can even see the table view of all the different bins, the bin radiuses, the angles, and so on. So this is where I get all of that flat view information. And the unique thing about Onshape's approach here is it's live. If I make a change to the folded model, it instantly updates in the flat view. So I get that real-time feedback, you know, especially important if you start adding edges and flanges uh, that cause a flat pattern conflict. You know, in other CAD systems, you'd have to go in, view the flat pattern, and then realize, oh, no, there's a problem. And on shape, you're going to immediately see it in the flat view. So that is the sheet metal model, uh, sheet metal flat view and table view. Again, you can left click this icon to see that. Now I mentioned before there are three ways. Let's discuss the second way that we have for creating a sheet metal part. I go back to the sheet metal model and I choose, in this case we're going to choose thicken. And you can think of thicken as selecting faces, you know, planar faces, and it offsetting those faces and then you can define edges between them. So I want to create a top half of the enclosure for our cabinet here. So I can choose thicken, left click the individual faces, and it's going to, just like before, go in and offset each individual face with its own sheet. Now it's up to me to define the edges that are bends. Right? So that's the next step, edges to bend, and I'm just going to left click where each edge joins and make sure that they are now bends, right? So that is the thicken option. Again, just you're, you're selecting, you know, flat faces, it's offsetting them and then go in and define these are the edges that are bends, right? I hit the green check and now I have my second sheet metal part in this part studio. Now, the last technique that I wanted to discuss is extruding an open contour, an open profile. And in you know many other CAD systems, this is a familiar workflow, so I wanted to discuss it. I think a lot of users are going to be familiar with this process. And it's essentially just taking you know an open shape, like this sketch that you can see here, and extruding it. And that extruded part should then unfold, of course. So the way we do this is very simple. We go to the same sheet metal model command in the toolbar, same exact button that we've selected before, but this time we choose extrude, right? So I choose extrude, and then I define what are the sketch curves that I want to extrude. Now I can select them one line at a time from the graphics. So if I just want to grab like a few pieces of a sketch and extrude it, I can do that. But if you have many different lines, selecting them one at a time isn't really advantageous. What you can do is just select the entire sketch from the feature list. And so if you have several lines, it's much easier to just select the sketch from the feature list. We can define our end type here as symmetric. Let's say 90 millimeters depth. I hit the green check OK. And now I have my third sheet metal part in this part studio. Right Again, just using that familiar open contour work, you know, open sketch contour extrude. And then of course you can see the flat view if I go back to my sheet metal table and flat view. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention is as you add more parts to a single part studio, you'll see an option at the top to define what part do you want to look at, right? What flat view do you want to see? In this case, let's go to sheet metal model three. And here's that latest part that we just created with our extrude option. So those are the three ways that we have for creating sheet metal parts. Uh, if you're interested in more sheet metal information, definitely check out the webinar we've done in the past on that. If you do a search just for Onshape Sheet Metal, you should find that. Um, we've done webinars and videos on in the past that go into more detail on sheet metal in particular. Uh, but definitely one of the biggest improvements that we've made in 2017. All right, so let's move on to the next one, managed in-context design. And this is a commonly asked question when we talk about assembly design. And the qu question that gets asked often is, do you have a way of designing in the context of the assembly? And the answer is yes. Using managed in-context design, you can create 
parts, even just features that relate to the assembly, right? That are that are in context with the assembly. So let me give you an example of this. Here I have a simple uh, step stool, and this is an example where you know the movement of the step stool, the in and out motion, is really dependent on certain positions of the assembly. So when it comes to designing the linkage that joins them, when it comes to creating the cuts in this bar that match the motion of the assembly, the movement of the assembly is really critical, right? The, those various positions and designing around those positions is really important. So this is where in context can be especially valuable. Um, so let me give you an example. Let's say that I wanted to create the cutouts in this main bar. And I want to match both the open and closed position of this step stool, right? Two different positions of the assembly, and I need to create cuts in the bar in this bar to accommodate for both. Now, I've already got an, a created context. So if I right-click on the bar, you're going to see an option here to edit in context. Now, if this is the first time that you're using it, you'll want to start here with edit in context. I'm going to start with a context I've created called open, and you'll see the option here to edit in context. Now what's going to happen here is it's gonna take me back to the part studio that I'm right clicking on, right? Remember, we were in the assembly, I right clicked one of the parts in the assembly, and I chose to edit in context. What it does is it takes me back to the part studio. But what I get is a snapshot of that assembly, right? I get, you know, just that in context state of the assembly in my part studio. And so now I can reference it with different things, right? So I can come in and say, you know, let's create a sketch, for instance, on, you know, plane four, right? And I can reference in this sketch edges of a part from the assembly. Right, so I can grab these edges and convert them very easily. Right, so now I just created a context to the assembly in that state. Right, in this open, you know, variation. Right, the open state of the of the assembly. So I can hit the green check OK, and now I've got an a, a a sketch tied to the context of the assembly. You'll see a little icon there for in context references. So now I've created that initial you know, sketch that's going to drive the cut for the open position of this step stool. What I want to do next is go back to the assembly. You'll see a little icon here at the top that says go to assembly. That will take me back to the assembly where I can then go down. Let's go into the closed position for the step stool. And again, I'm going to edit in context. So I'll right click the same bar and I'll choose Edit in Context. What I'm doing here is creating a second context. So I have an open position and a closed position. I need to create a second context for that closed position. Now I'm taken back to the same part studio, but notice the assembly position's closed. Right? So if I go back to the sketch, I can even edit the same sketch. Right? And now I'm in a separate context and I can reference parts, right? No different than I would, um, you know, if I were sketching the thing in, in by itself without the assembly, right? So I can grab edges, I can grab faces and so on um, and convert them. The main thing that I wanted to stress here is just keep in mind, uh, you can design around those contextual positions of the assembly. All right, so we are running out of time, and I still have a lot to discuss from July, so let's move on. What I want to discuss ne next is just briefly, I don't have any examples um, specifically regarding them, um, but I just want to mention briefly the curves and surfacing tools. So in January, we announced managed in-context design. Um, in February, we announced simultaneous sheet metal. And then we really worked on curves and surfacing commands. And that's been our focus for quite some time now, amongst other commands, of course. But but a lot of our effort that you've seen in the What's New, if you've been watching, has come in the area of curves. And, of course, curves are useful in creating proper surfaces. Right. So many different curve tools, projected curve, bridging curve, 
a composite curve. Even 3D spline functions have been built into core on shape just in the last few months. And so if you've tried doing any kind of surface modeling in the past and struggled, definitely try it now, especially when we start talking about you know, commands like bridging curve. They can make a huge difference in you know, creating the boundaries for a fill or creating the guides for a log. So many curves, many surfacing tools, way too many to discuss in the time that we have here. But if you're interested, definitely do a search for the last few What's New updates where we've covered those in greater detail. Now, I mentioned this before, but I, I do want to briefly just mention it again. Uh, for those companies out there using Onshape, it's very critical to get the, the correct properties, the correct metadata associated with your CAD models. You can now do that. You can build your own custom properties that automatically propagate to company-owned documents, right? So really cool stuff, and, and you can do a lot of really neat things that, again, are normally tied to very expensive PDM systems. On shape, these are core functions. And I've already mentioned this, but much, much more than what we've covered here today. All right, so let's get into the last 30 days or so, right? So what happened in July? And there were two big updates that took place in July, July 10th and July 25th. Now, I mentioned this uh, briefly in, in kind of a broader context earlier, but we've been focused for, for quite some time now on surfacing tools. And you, you've seen a lot of that lately, especially in the July 10th update. Some very big uh, surfacing tools were added that really kind of round out a lot of our surfacing commands. So there are two big ones that I want to mention and briefly show you here, and that is fill and enclose. Now, these are critical functions if you're doing surface modeling. And the reason I bring that up is fill allows you to select a boundary and automatically fill it with a surface. And enclose allows you to take that surface model and enclose it into a solid, right? So these were two very highly requested features from anyone doing surface modeling, and we now have them as of this July 10th update. Now, this wasn't the only surfacing improvement, or I should say, you know, advanced shape improvement, right? Because the loft command got an improvement as well. And this isn't specific to surface modeling, right? You have these same tools in solid modeling as well. Guides and end conditions, for example, can now work together. In the past, they were mutually exclusive. If you chose one, you couldn't choose the other. So guides and end conditions and lofts now work together, and that wasn't the case in the past. If you ever struggled with defining an end condition while using a guide, it's because you couldn't. You had to choose one or the other. Now you don't. So guides and end conditions and loft now work together. The other big improvements that I like to mention is you can save section views as named views. So if you find yourself creating a section view, the same section view often, save it as a named view, and you don't have to keep going back and creating that section view in the model. And I'm talking about in the Part Studio or Assembly. So save section views as name views. And then there are other big improvements to whole features and then many improvements to drawings. The improvements to whole features that I would mention are the two big ones, many more whole sizes. So there are many, if you, if you used whole feature in the past, you couldn't find a certain size, try again. We added a lot of different sizes to whole feature. And these are just standard sizes that have been added to already pretty big library of, of whole sizes. Um, the other big improvement, and this is very important if you create sheet metal, is you can now use whole feature on sheet metal parts. In the past, you couldn't do this. So this was a limitation. That is no longer the case. You can now use whole feature on sheet metal parts. Um, there are way too many drawing improvements to mention, especially in the time frame that we have. I would definitely recommend, if you're interested, checking out that What's New blog where we discuss the drawing improvements in a lot of detail. Uh, this update and the next update got a, a pretty big set of improvements to drawings. I'm going to discuss some of the drawing improvements in the next update as well. All right, so let's get into this. Now, fill and close, I think, were the big ones that I really wanted to make sure to mention in this in this webinar, because I think for a lot of users out there doing any kind of advanced shapes, this is going to be a very important command. Um, so let me give you an example of this here. I have you know an ice axe where I have some shapes that would be difficult to create using solid modeling techniques. So we'll, let's go into let's run back here. Actually, let's not edit. Let's 
roll to that point. All right, so let's, I'm going to right click fill four here, roll to here. So we're going to roll back to a point in this ice axe. And what I want to point out is this model is 100% surfaces. So lofted surfaces, filled surfaces, 100% uh, surface model. And the question that, that we often got asked when we talk about surface design, or any kind of advanced shape design, is, you know, do you have the ability to patch a surface or to define a boundary, sometimes it's referred to as, or to fill a surface? And this is another commonly referred to term for just taking a boundary and constructing a surface out of it. If we take a look at this model, you'll see that it's, it's largely intact with, a, with the exception of this one open face. So everything else is closed except this. You can see the edges here define this open face. What's important with a fill is that you have a boundary of edges. So in this example, I have this boundary of edges that define what I want the surface to be. So that's where I would use fill. You'll find fill in the far right of the toolbar under offset surface, you'll see fill. And it's very simple to use. You just go through and define, here are the edges that define my boundary. So again, you must create a, you must select a series of edges that define a boundary, and it fills that boundary with a surface. All right. So if I can go all the way out there, you can see there's the surface that we created. Now, one thing that's that's really unique about this, one thing that's really cool about this is you can go in and define the continuity of the edges that you select. So in this example, I would want a, a smooth transition from the handle to the ice axe head, so to speak. And you can see that I'm getting this sharp transition immediately from the edge into the ice axe head, and that's not really what I want. So I can go into the edges. You can see as I mouse over the edges, they highlight in yellow there. And I can say, no, this should not be position. It should be tangency. You know, give me tangency with respect to to that edge and I can go through and define all the edges where I want tangency and it will go through and create a much smoother transition in our example. All right, so now I can see I have a smooth transition from the handle of the ice axe into that fill. And so you can define an individual continuity you know, definition for each edge that you select, right? So really a robust tool, it's really a, a very valuable tool when you can't use like loft, for instance, I just have, you know, many different edges. I got to patch all of this in. And it's also really useful if you need to match surrounding faces. You know, I want smooth curvature. Or I want to blend the face from this, you know, maybe loft or some unrelated feature between these two things, right? So uh, fill is absolutely a vital command if you're doing any kind of complex, you know, more advanced shapes. Um, a command like this becomes really, really valuable. Now, the other thing I would mention with this is you can also define guide vertices. So if you want to control the, the surface even further, you can literally sketch points uh, and, and define those points as, you know, I want the surface to pass through at you know, this point. So it, it takes it even further in terms of control. But if you're looking to emphasize a certain piece of the surface, that is definitely a way to do it with a guide vertice. Um, the other cool thing I would mention is you can show the ISO curves here, and it will give you, you know, kind of an idea of the blend that that has with the surrounding geometry. Right? So very cool stuff. Um, the last thing I want to mention, this is just kind of a neat uh, improvement to it, is when you when you encapsulate a surface like I am here, it's going to automatically convert it into a solid, right? So one neat addition is if you're, if you're doing a bunch of surface modeling and your final feature is you're doing this one last fill to fill everything in, it will automatically convert it to a solid for you. So you don't have to do that as a, a separate step. So just a tip there. Um, but the fill command in general is, is a very valuable one. And something that many, many users, anyone doing any kind of surface modeling, any kind of advanced shape is, is looking for. Right? They're looking for that ability to fill in or patch in those different surfaces. 
So that's an example of fill. The other thing that I would mention here is enclose. Now, the enclose command is, again, a very important part of the advanced shape workflow. The, the, the surface modeling workflow is generally you create all of these different surfaces till you create an enclosed volume out of those surfaces. Oftentimes, surface modeling is modeling face by face. And then you create this enclosed volume that you then want to convert to a solid. And, and, and the goal of surface modeling for most users still is to end up with a solid model. Right? It's just a technique that they take to get there. And so a very important part of that workflow is converting that enclosed volume into a solid. And we do that with the new enclose command. So you'll find enclose in the toolbar in the Part Studio here. And it's pretty straightforward. You select a surface or surfaces, you can choose multiple, that make up an enclosed volume. Right? So in this case, I've got this mouse shape where I've got one big surface on top and then one filled surface on bottom. I'm going to select both of them and it will take that, take that enclosed volume and convert it to a solid part, right? So oftentimes for any kind of advanced shape, this is the last step in the process, right? Once you've got that you know, nice model built with all the details built, you know, oftentimes face by face, you know, general surface modeling techniques, you've built this enclosed volume now you're ready to convert it into a solid. Enclose is the command that you're going to do that with, right? So just select a, a surface or multiple surfaces that make up an enclosed volume, and it will automatically convert it into a solid, right? So those are finished mouse. So that's another commonly asked question. Do you have the ability to convert from surface to solid? Of course, we have Thicken. We've had Thicken for quite some time now, but we've never had a way to take an enclosed volume of surfaces and convert that into a solid part. Now we do, and that is enclose. All right, so let's move on. Now, the next improvements that I just want to briefly mention, um, I mentioned this already before, but now in the loft command, uh, you can use guides and end conditions together. And there's nothing, I don't have an example specifically for this, but just keep in mind, you can use them in, you know, uh, together. In the past, you had to use one or the other. So that's something to mention, especially if you do more complex, more advanced shapes. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is saving section views as named views. And I think a lot of users out there have requested something like this, where you know I find myself constantly creating this same section view over and over. I always like to look at the model a certain way, and it's with this section view at this certain position. And in the past, if you worked this way, uh, you found yourself constantly having to recreate this section view. So the big thing that I would point out with this improvement is when you create a section view and then you create a named view while in the section view, it will remember the fact that you were in a section view. So essentially, named views remember that section view state, right? And it just means that if you find yourself going into you know these common section view scenarios, you can just remember it, right? I can end the named view commands. I don't have to continually create new section views. So the big thing is, you know, let's do a, a quick section view here. Um, as you create your section view, as you're in your section view command, make sure uh, to create a named view, right? Don't leave the section view as part of that um, first. You don't want to do that. Bear with me for a moment here. All right. The next one that I wanted to mention, forgive me there, 
is an improvement to hole feature. Um, and this one isn't a big one unless you do a lot of sheet metal design, but it's going to be huge if you do sheet metal design. Um, bear with me for a second here. So I've put in a point and I want to create a hole feature with that point, right? So in the past, if you did this, if you tried to do this, uh, you'll know that it didn't work unless you finished the uh, sheet metal feature. And that's not very useful if you need to then go laser cut or water jet cut this hole. So now uh, there's nothing really complex to, to explain here. It just simply works, right? So if I choose hole feature, I left click a point, it will create the hole in the part, right? You can see the hole there in the part. Uh, just keep in mind, this is something that was a limitation in the past and is no longer the case. Right? If you use hole feature, it will work on sheet metal parts even before they've been finished. Right? All right, so the last thing I want to mention, we are running out of time here, and I'm trying to get through a lot of things. There were many drawing improvements with this update. I'm going to focus on the drawing improvements of July 25th. If you're interested, definitely check out the What's New blog. We'll recover these, uh, some of the this more um, specific drawing improvements in the July 10th update. But let's jump into July 25th just for time's sake and move into the most recent improvements. So this was the most recent update. And really the focus for this, this update was drawings. And I think drawings were a, a big part of this list of improvements. Um, the biggest improvement I would say is the drawing dimension improvements. So in on-shape drawings, you no longer have to choose what dimension type that you want first. And so if you want to create an angle dimension, then follow that up with a diameter dimension, then follow that up with a dimension between two lines. You don't have to go back and forth between different commands in the toolbar. There's one dimension command that will do all of those things. So I think that's the biggest improvement in this July 25th update. You just have the ability to dimension using one tool rather than many. Um, the other big improvement I would mention is partial section views. Now you can grab that section view line and drag it up and create a partial section view. Uh, the other improvement I would mention is exporting drawings. When you export drawings, you can now export it to a tab in the document. Now you may ask, well, why is this important? I think the primary reason that's important is drawing templates. If you want to create a drawing template, you can mock up your template in Onshape Drawings, right? I can even sketch out the title block if I wanted to. Um, and then I can save that as a template and save it directly to a tab so that I don't have to uh, then import and export and do all that workflow that we had in the past. So that improvement is especially important for creating drawing templates. Now you can go from an Onshape Drawing to a template based on that Onshape Drawing with just a couple clicks. No need to import or export. Um, the other big thing is weld symbol improvements. We added weld symbols a few updates ago. The improvements uh, continue. So uh, spot and seam welds were added with this update. So that was a big one, a highly requested one to the weld symbol functionality is that specific um, you know, specific look for spot and seam welds. Um, we added the ability to add drawing view names. So you can now name your drawing views, which helps when we talk about organization. We're going to add even more functionality in terms of this later on. And then the big improvement I would say to the modeling environment, the part modeling environment, is the ability to flip the sketch text. You know, in this update, you now have a flip horizontal, flip vertical option in the sketch text command. So when you're sketching text, you can flip the orientation of the text with a few clicks. It doesn't require dragging the text around, and you can mirror it and all kinds of cool stuff. So uh, that was definitely the big improvement to part modeling with this update. So let's jump into an example of this. Bear with me for just one second here. We're going to bring up a drawing, but this stuff is pretty straightforward to show. The main thing that I would stress with this, the probably the biggest improvement uh, with this update, is just that ability to dimension the way you want. Right, So you don't have to um, select line, line, dimension, then select line, line. You don't have to... Um, select diameter dimension and then go select a diameter. It doesn't force you to go back and forth between the toolbar and the drawing itself. You select one dimension command from the toolbar and you have 
everything you need, right? So this is something a lot of you have requested for quite some time now, um, and it's definitely something that you know we, we've wanted to have for quite some time now. Uh, Forgive me, this is the second time now my screen has frozen. There we go. Okay, so uh, I mentioned before, you don't need any special dimension commands anymore. So you still have the original dimension tools, um, but this dimension command at the very top should be everything that you need to create the basic dimension types, right? And the exceptions might be, um, you know, things like, um, uh, forgive me, ordinate dimensions or whole callouts, right? There are still dedicated commands for those, but really it's, you know, point to point dimensions, radius dimensions, you know, here you can see I'm selecting all of those things and I'm not going back and forth between different commands to do so, right? So again, just keep in mind, you now have one dimension tool that will do most of the dimensions that you need. The exceptions might be if you use ordinate dimensions or the whole callout specifically is a, def, uh, a dedicated command, a separate command. But now you have this dimension command, very easy to use, and it doesn't mean you don't have to go back and forth anymore. I think that's the big thing. Um, so that is probably the biggest improvement that I wanted to focus on in this July 25th update. Again, just keep in mind drawing dimension improvements uh, is something that users have requested since we launched Strong. So it's, you know, I want to be able to use one dimension tool to do everything. So drawing dimension improvements were a big one. Uh, partial section views are another. It's just a matter of dragging that section view line up to where you want your partial partial section to end, and it will be there. Also, weld symbol improvements, drawing view names. Again, definitely check out the What's New blog uh, if you're interested in more detail on those. So that's what I had planned. Those are the improvements both to you know the last eight months in general. Again, you know, kind of recapping the last eight months, I think it managed in context editing was big, sheet metal was big, and all the various surfacing tools that allow you to create some of the more advanced shapes um, are all big improvements in this last you know eight months. A lot of big improvements in that area. Now, when we talk about July specifically. Well, July 10th was a lot of surface tools, right? A lot of advanced shape tools, fill and close, partial section views, you know, um, uh, for, forgive me, fill and close um, guides and in conditions and loss, right? Those three alone were major improvements to surfacing, and they all happened on that July 10th update. Now, July 25th was really all about the drawings, and I've discussed, I think, the big improvement there being that drawing dimension improvement. All right, so that's what I had planned. I am going to stick around and answer any questions that you have. There's a questions dialog in the GoToWebinar control panel. Feel free to ask any question, and I'll do my best to stick around, make sure that all the questions are addressed. But that's what I had planned. Thank you. Have a good day.